The Talk Station presents Faith Matters, a look at contemporary stories and issues from a faith perspective. While this is a pre recorded show, we are interested in your ideas, comments, and questions, and we urge you to email them to faithmatters at the talk station faith matters and welcome to our program once again i'm ben ball and uh, joined today with uh, reverend robert cornegie associate pastor chapel by the sea in emerald isle and the bishop doc loomis the bishop in residence at all saints anglican in newport and good day gentlemen good morning it's great to be here and welcome back robert thank you uh, today, we I think we have a very eclectic mix of uh, different subjects to look at today. Uh, and let's, uh, let's start with one that isn't ex- explicitly about uh, um, mentioning about faith, but I think we can uh, certainly relate to the subject matter, uh, given all our ages and the things that we've grown up and uh, through as well. And this is uh, uh, from San Francisco. It's coming out of the Washington Post, but it's about a San Francisco middle school that made national news this past week called Everett Middle School. They had had a visit from Chelsea Clinton promoting her book and, and inspiring the students, etc. And then if the students were inspired, it says it didn't last long. When Everett held its election three days later, this is a middle school now, the principal promptly refused to release the results, saying she was concerned that the winners were not diverse enough. Uh, while she would ultimately relent and release the results, her decision spurred anger among the parents and kids who felt that the principal was putting diversity ahead of democracy. You guys have uh, seen this article now. It's about the um, a young pr- principal, 36-year-old principal, Lena Van Heron. Uh, and uh, she she withheld the results. They were surprised when they didn't get the results the next day, and then it would go on and on and on, and eventually send out an email to the parent saying that she withheld the results because there was not enough diversity. Uh, Robert, um, you know, even in, in we we talk about church uh, and uh, we wonder about diversity, and that's a buzzword through institutions like ours, institutions in school, in fact, all over. Is it a misplaced, are we looking at a misplaced kind of um, um, priority here? Well, I'm just curious why Washington Post <laughs> even had the story. You know, it's a it's a fascinating thing. But um, look, I used to be a liberal, and I, I used to think I could think, could remember how liberals think. But I, it's getting harder and harder for me to remember <laughs> how you could justify something like that. That may be an age thing, though, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be true, too. <laughs> But, um, yeah, it's this fascinating thing about, um, you know, the, the, the culture of America has all, we've always been a law based society and, and the basis of that constitutional law. And there's certain constitutional law that we teach each generation that talks about what is right and what is wrong as a society, what we do. And one of those things is that we have free and fair elections. We don't try to manipulate these elections. And so suddenly when this <laughs> this uh, authority in the school decides that the outcome of the election didn't fit her concept of um, a fair and free election well fair not so much free she yes, she kind of right. concentrated on the fair part didn't she mm-hmm. so uh, and and so she or now her excuse was that she wanted to create a dialogue i understand by well, kind of pressurizing that or would that may have been a later this, justification that, yeah, that was a rationalization justification, yeah. Uh, yeah actually in her email she wrote to parents she says this is complex but as a parent and a principal i truly believe it behooves us to be thoughtful that, about our next steps here so that we can have a diverse student council that is truly representative of all voices at everett 
she wrote, according to the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, Van Haren then suggested that school add positions to improve diversity. So, so a quota system, basically, <laughs> is what she's wanting to institute there. And did she we really that pack the court? I think at one point in yeah, history. Yeah, did she really use the word behooves? behooves. Yes, yeah. I always worry when, the, when there's somebody in a position of authority that uses behooves. It behooves us. Oh yeah. my goodness. Well, the post follows this story because the post follows Chelsea Clinton. Right. Aha. What makes this story a story is that Chelsea left her footprints there, and then in her wake was a disaster. <laughs> I don't know where she gets that. <laughs> but uh, we're not supposed to talk about politics. It's about faith. And it, it's a, it, it, so it's a, it is an interesting story. It's, it is, what's interesting to me is the whole move toward diversity training. So if you go on the web today, and all of you at home Sunday morning, just go ahead, type in diversity training. And 650,000 companies will pop up who all do diversity training. Mm -hmm. We do it in schools. We do it in the workplace. And the argument is for diversity training. We do it in our denominational training now. You do diversity training? Yes, absolutely. Oh, my goodness. Do you talk about Anglicans? (laughs) And the Methodists. We have have, have determined, and I mean, it is a fact, that there are more Asians and more Hispanics specifically coming into the workplace and coming into the schools. There's mm-hmm. not a question about that. Now, where and, and so what the idea was, was that we are going to train people about different cultures so that when they understand what different cultures are, there will be less headbanging in, in the – in the school or in the workplace, we'll know how to. We'll know what people think. And we'll know how to handle them. We'll know how to have conversations. We'll even have diversity. Uh, what do they call now? Diversity managers mm-hmm. who can step into a, a a situation where diversity does not exist and bring diversity, and bring calm to that situation. So this is a thing that's happened in schools. And what's funny is that we have diversity training in our schools. You have it in your denomination. But really, it's kind of a it's kind of ridiculous because let me give you an example. If you take anatomy and physiology in school, you get training in diversity. If you teach, if you if you learn about democracy in school or politics, you get diversity. Mm-hmm. If you study anthropology, you get diversity. If if you're in kindergarten and you're studying potty habits, you will get diversity. Mm-hmm. Diversity is now become a part of every major teaching area in the church. It almost seems redundant to have a diversity training. Now, back to this lovely lady and this principal. By her own admission, she could have handled this better. Really? I mean, I think the idea is to have this conversation before we have an election. Right. And I mean, imagine this happening. I mean, seriously, imagine this happening on a national level. Imagine, imagine a vote happening uh, like, the, like the recent uh, House elections. And somebody in a position of authority looking at that and saying, you know, this is just isn't diverse enough. Mm-hmm. We just really, we need to sit down and talk about this. There's way too many whatever Republicans. They, she needs to learn a lesson from a couple of elections ago. And if she wants to hold up an election, she needs to blame hanging chads on the ballot and then bring the court in. Right. UCLA, <laughs> That's the mature way the, to do it. The, the, the quote um, um, uh, of, from a UCLA law professor here is interesting. It says, um, it says if, uh, the, the article goes on to say, let me read a couple pages before that. Uh, is the irony is that a middle school student election had turned a political quagmire worthy of Congress wasn't lost on anyone. If the story upset students and parents in the Mission District, it soon spread to the rest of San Francisco and beyond. The quote from UCLA law professor Eugene Volkoff, or Volok, is uh, the story ups- uh well, the children's voices were heard. They just seem to be less obsessed with the race than some administrators are. Colorblind. The kids didn't care. The, the the school or the area is um, or is a percentage about the school. I've lost that uh, that quote here, but I think it's twenty percent of the students are white, eighty percent and eighty percent of color. They uh-huh. said, right? Yeah. And, and so I guess that means other than white. So the students didn't really, you know, we don't know what the results were. We don't know which way they tilted. Yeah, that's the, what that. uh, one of the students, seventh grader Sebastian Kaplan said, uh, and he had run for class representative, yet he has no clue a week later if he won. He said, the whole school voted for these people. 
So it is not like people rigged the game. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but in a way, now it's kind of being rigged. And the little children shall little leave seventh them grader. There, you know? So what is that seventh grader learning about the political, um, the polity process? In, more, in 1921, my grandfather graduates from Kent Normal School. You remember the normal schools? That's where you went to get an education to be a teacher. You're right. And uh, I have this wonderful picture of them at their kind of final social and dance. I think there were 21 students in the class, fairly equally divided, men and women. And there's a banner hanging over the photograph of the, the graduates, and it says simply, character, not fame. That was their, you know, nowadays you have a, your class motto is, you know, over the rainbow, right. or Star Wars, whatever. But back then they actually thought through these things. What, what frustrates the living daylights out of me about this stuff and the whole diversity element or the whole political correctness element is what we're teaching our children is that what we should make decisions based on diversity, make decisions based on political correctness. In other words, the person I choose should be the person who's the most correct. And I actually don't come from there. I wanted my kids to understand that I wanted them to pick the person whose character shined. Right. That it was actually an issue of character in elections. As Christians, I think we're called to elect people of character, of high moral value. Right. Not of black, white, old, young boy or girl. Right. I, you know, we, you and I, Robert, and I think Ben too, as a Methodist, come hmm. from a faith where we understand that there isn't Jew and Greek and male and female, but it has an awful lot to do with our, our standing among men, our character in Christ. Isn't that the paradox, though? That you know, we heard it from Martin Luther King. It's not the color of your skin; it's the character, Con the content your of your character. Content, yes. And yet, we've forgotten that. More to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the Talk Station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And I'm Ben Ball, along with Reverend Robert Cornig and Bishop uh, Doc Loomis. And our next article I want to look at is actually comes from the Atlantic Monthly. And uh, this is, or they just call it the Atlantic now, I think. Uh, and the title is The Misplaced Fear of Religion in Classrooms. Now, this is actually a book review or an interview with an author of a book. And the, the book is uh, called Faith Ed, Teaching About Religion in an Age of Intolerance. Uh, but I'd like to start with uh, some of the introductory language in the book. It goes. Uh, it starts how uh, the, the beginning of school brings various things that have to do with religion in, in classrooms, and and then outlines some of the things that end up being in the news. Uh, but uh, the second paragraph is an old rule of etiquette often taught to children from a young age is to never talk about religion in polite company. Uh, this sentiment carries over into public schools where teaching about the world's religions often sparks controversy and charges from some parents and activists that classrooms are an inappropriate place for this discussion. Yet educators frequently counter that a public school curriculum is incomplete without religious literacy, which the American public sorely lacks. According to a 2010 Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life survey, in a country of many faiths and beliefs, there's a stunning absence of knowledge about the world's religions. And where better to discuss a thorny topic like religion, some say, than in the public school classroom? Well, we might counter that there's another place to discuss that too. But uh, they note that uh, discomfort is a natural and essential part of the learning process here too. So it goes on to talk again with this author. But before we get to that, what about the, the premise here and the basic premise? Uh, Doc, uh, uh, that, that religious literacy does have its place in the public school. What do you think? Well, there's nothing I like better than a little dissension in the public school. And so <laughs> if this causes pain and suffering, it's probably – and i got to tell you, in a way, it is actually true. I mean, we have taken all – Challenge. I mean, the last story we just did, mm -hmm. we don't want people to be offended. We don't want people to be hurt. We want everybody to have a trophy. We don't want there to be an actual conversation in the school system about faith and what matters. About no it. dissension. No dissension yes, whatsoever. Right. We must right. not have it. And so this, this goal to avoid dissension at all costs, I think, is, is actually costing us a lot. I completely agree with that. Well... 
You, and Robert? Yeah, well, look, I mean, this hits kind of close to home because I'm involved in a mm -hmm. ministry on the on the college campuses, and um, that that is an apologetics ministry, which is about discussing the hard things, the things that we disagree on, but doing it with civility and with respect. And so we're trying to uh, integrate back into the system of education that it, you know, where we are, it is a place where you are able to talk about pretty much anything, but the, the ground rules are you do it with civility and you do it with respect and, and not tear each other down. We've lost that ability to do that. And so, you know, as, as you mentioned, Doc, that, that article that we just did was all about trying to pretend and protect our children from learning how to kind of work through these conflict, these ideas, these different worldviews. I mean, really, that's what we're talking about when we talk about religion, that we're looking at, at the world in kind of different ways. And so in, in our, our comparative religion courses, right. Right. you know, you start to understand that not everybody views the world the way you view it. And, and then you have to determine, okay, yeah, there are lots of different ways to look at the world. Are, are, is there, where is truth in the middle of that? How do we get to truth? Okay, and take it, take it to the next step. And that is this. You, you're basically taking school teachers and desaturating them. Here's what I mean. You're saying you can't actually teach from the position you hold. Now, before you jump on me and say, well, yeah, that's the way it should be, I actually don't think so. I think what we've done is we're teaching our students right now that the only position worth holding is no position. It's the politically correct position. That's right. And so if my teacher is standing up in front of the class and has no heart for what he, he or she is teaching, has no relationship to tell me about, has no experience in his or her own life, then then I might, I might as well just be in front of a computer monitor watching a video at, at home. Right. I mean, okay. I want that. I want that. That human person. All of us in this room had a teacher who significantly impacted our life, because that teacher was a real person who had real beliefs and had real arguments. And and now we're just saying you can't do that anymore. Don't show children what it looks like to be a human being with thoughts and beliefs. Now, just, now uh, I know Rush refers to young people as brains full of mush. Uh, the idea that uh, they can they're molded and shaped you know, maybe maybe correctly maybe incorrectly at times and this uh, this author has said that uh, some of the pushback uh, her name is Wertheimer uh, that some of the pushback from the idea of teaching religious uh, faiths in school settings or in college, university settings says some parents feel, feared that if children learned about another religion they might fall fall out of love with their own faith. But she describes that uh, as being um, that's not a credible uh, position to take when referring to world history courses that wrap instruction about different religions. The courses I observe teach students basic information. The the interviewer said, "Teach, not preach." So, is is it possible then to have a discussion on these on out of their face or to learn about them without somebody expressing their passion? For that. Well, I think that's the challenge. And, and you know, I, I, in our break, I was talking about um, a couple of students in our group that uh, are taking a, a New Testament course and how in that course. And this is at a university at level. At a university level. And in that course, they really are not allowed to talk about. I mean, they can say it. But she said, you know, one of the girls said, you know, I've noticed that the teacher doesn't call on me very often now. Because she is very passionate about her faith as a Christian, and when the when her faith gets mischaracterized, mm -hmm. which happens in these classes sometimes, because like you said, Doc, there are teachers that are not are teaching something that's they've read in a book, they they haven't had the relevatory experience, and so they, there's no passion there and, and it gets confusing sometimes but i think that's the goal i well, think that i think they would like every teacher in every school neutered yeah or desaturated so that they there is no passion yeah and so that they really are they don't the students feel like these students anyway feel like why are we going through these motions of learning something about a faith that is not 
it's not real. I mean, it's that's right. It's it's an either or kind of thing. There's like this, uh, you know, you can pretty much all roads lead to God in this coursework. In and, this article, again, the author says uh, that uh, there's a fear, real fear, proselytizing when it comes to classes about the Bible as literature or history. Parents should be the most concerned about those types of courses. Those classes can be taught objectively, and in fact, I found such an example at Lumberton High School, target of so much fuss over teachers' lessons on Islam. I know uh, in our, we've had small group studies that would like to learn more about Islam, and, uh, and, uh, but it's been expressed as, well, are we going to learn it from a point of view, or are we going to learn it from an objective nature? Is it possible to do one or the other? That's... That's the question, and I think that's isn't that the the object here? Is that uh, she says it is possible to 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 learn that? You can learn, learn the tenets of of the faith: Buddhism, Hinduism, well, mm-hmm. you know, whatever ism you want to pursue. You can you can study those, but when you're talking about why some people, for, for instance, in Islam, and of course this is this is uh, there are people that are willing to die for their faith. Mm-hmm. Well, you're not going to get that in a classroom there they can't go there there's just no way they can go there and so yeah it's uh you're getting you're getting world religion from about thirty thousand feet mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's just basically kind of like a, a a survey of the old testament well you probably you all just, remember i mean we used to have it on our copy ta- coffee table the time life book of world religion exactly you know? absolutely Exactly. Yeah, and I think, you know, we, you really want to pull this catfish out of the hole and fillet it here. The reality is no one is concerned about proselytizing. I mean, I know that's what it says in this article. Mm-hmm. What they're concerned about is the lawsuit that comes after the alleged <laughs> proselytizing. Yeah, right. This is right. all these, you know, we do so many of these articles on this show, and they, they all come down to to lawsuits. I mean, that's the bottom line. Yeah. That is the club that, the, that, that conservatives, Christians, and just Gosh, people that want to express anything passionately are getting clubbed with all the time. This, however, is uh, uh, this is an interesting story because it's just one more example of an ally that we as Christians, because this is a Christian faith matters kind of show, that we've lost. I mean... We have, since the founding of this country, lost every. We've lost the ally of government. We've lost the ally of the military. We've lost the ally of the school. We've lost the ally of the courts. We've lost the ally of, gosh, I don't know, coaches praying at, at sporting events. And so, what's happening is, is as all these allies are falling off the side, yeah. it's peeling it back and it's making it very clear to me that the the church who could lean on society now has to stand up for itself and our work is increasingly important now and we have to take what we do in our congregations and what we do as pastors and what you know you and the audience do as pastors and lay people we got to start taking this really serious because there's nobody out there's no net anymore that's right if we're not teaching at the church they're not going to get it at school if we're not standing up for it in our locality the court is not going to rule in our favor. We have lost our allies. Well, Thank and, God we have we have one ally that we've not lost. What's that? That'd be Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And, well, you know, the, pro, the, the sad reality is that there, there are churches out there that are teaching a different kind of form of Christianity. So even the church, you have to be careful about what's being taught in there. So, uh, But, yeah, I think it's uh, – and this is why, like I said, you know, apologetics – and uh, other forms of debate, if you will, of where we try to sit down and talk about the, um, mm-hmm. the, the reality, the truth of the matter are so important. Yeah. And we'll have more to come in a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. I'm Ben Ball, along with uh, Reverend Robert Cornegy and also uh, Bishop Doc Loomis. We'll have more to come in just a bit. Welcome back to Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 at AM 1240. Thanks for making us part of your morning or your Sunday morning. And as we gather together, talk about issues of faith that are in the news. Uh, I'm joined, I'm Ben Ball, and joined with uh, Reverend Robert Cornigan and Bishop Doc Loomis. And we're talking about uh, some of the 
uh, different issues. I want to follow up on one that we brought in last week and then and then add to that a story that came out this week. And from Bremerton High School, and Doc, you were, uh, remember last week we talked about this, Bremerton High School football coach, assistant football coach, his last name is Kennedy, he, was, um, he prays after games and he goes out to the middle of the field. You'll see this, you'll see an example of this in pro games and some college games too. It's usually players that are involved. It was, he goes out to the middle of the field and, mm-hmm. and, and the, sometimes a player will join and, and it's kind of grown over the season, right? It, it, it started out with just him and then some others would jump, join him, some of the others opposing team would come as well and they pray silently uh in the field uh in the middle of the field well it was a high school bremerton high school graduate wesley bonetti is the one who complained about this he took it to the district and said he he believes that that's a violation of the law and he wants to see kennedy punished for violating the law he went to the game last friday when uh, the coach kennedy said he would still do it even though the district had asked him not to and he went to it, and um, and the as of Monday, uh, Coach Kennedy still had his job, according to an article at, at uh, Fox 13 out of out of Bremerton, uh, Washington. Says on Monday, the district uh, said Coach Kennedy is still on job, but added the district continues to hope that the district and Mr. Kennedy can arrive at a common understanding that will ensure the rights of all community members are honored and the law is respected. Bonetti, the one who complained, says he can say that it's private, which is what. His lawyers, or uh, Coach Kennedy's lawyers, are saying from Liberty, uh, they're saying that it's private and silent. He can say it's private and silent, but he's a school employee until all players are out of their uniforms and on their way home, said Benetti. And uh, Kennedy went on Fox News Channel over the weekend to share his feelings about Friday night's prayer. Really overwhelming to see the support from the opposing team out there, said Kennedy. Uh, them and their coaches out there, perhaps he needs an English class, uh, uh, supporting what I was doing and praying alongside me. So Good thing uh, it's silent. Yes. <laughs> the, um, the, but that was happening. The opposing coaches also came out to pray, to support him, and other team members as well. And people from the stands got crowded there in the 50-yard line. So, uh, Doc, when we were talking about this last year, and you, you mentioned it here this morning already about that, that net not being there for Christians any longer, the schools not supporting uh, that our ideals or, or at least um, even lip service. Now, mm-hmm. and, and here we have a graduate who is complaining about it of that high school, complained to the district. Where do you think this goes here now? Is this, um, uh, he, he continues, he says he'll continue. Well, I hope he does. Uh, it's, again, let's take, a living, breathing human being who happens to be responsible for some of our kids and strip him of anything that, you know, from a from a faith perspective that makes him a, a real person. Mm-hmm. I mean, let's just let's just strip him bare. And all you can be is a desaturated, impotent football coach. That's all you can be. You can't have any influence on any other level of anybody's life, even in the, you know, in, in a in enacting your own life out in front of these kids. That's the part that absolutely makes me crazy, that anybody who walks within 15 feet of anything that receives government funding can no longer have a passion, can no longer have an inner life, can no longer have a faith, can no longer strongly believe anything. What are we doing? And so I say to this guy, thank God, yes, get out there and and show these kids what it looks like when there's something bigger than football. If I were a parent, I would be thrilled to death that my child was playing football and that there was somebody out there saying, but there's pieces of life that are actually more important than this. This guy, they should pick him up, and like we said last week, carry him off the field to a ticker tape parade. I love this guy. Robert doesn't, though. No, I do, and um, (laughs) very much. But um, I look forward to meeting him in heaven one day. (laughs) But, uh, you know, and and there's no but there, really. It's the truth is for the force of government, I mean, it's one thing to disagree with, with whether he should be doing this or not. Everybody has an opinion. You can have an opinion about this. There's no problem with that. But when you try to get force of law, of government, to, um, uh, uh, regulate this that's where we have the problem as far as i'm concerned that that the um 
this, you know, and we've talked about it here often, the difference between freedom of religious, religious expression, right. which is the way it's phrased, the freedom of religious expression versus the freedom of worship. And we have to kind of tease those two apart. And that's what government has done. It said, no, you don't have a um, um, Free self-evident right to express your religious beliefs publicly. What, you, what the government is going to protect is your right to go into your church or go into your home or go into a, a, an extension of that, perhaps, and, and have this worship experience with your God whomever your God is. And so they've taken away what the intent of the Constitution was to protect that that right to of religious expression. Or to at least to accommodate it. A, we went through this with the Kim Davis story, and now here we are again, with a, and the school doesn't want to accommodate his... It, well, we it, brought up last week the, uh, the alternative there, too, if it were a, a Muslim coming out. You mentioned, I think, coming out with their prayer rug. Yes, and I think what we all agreed is that from a Christian perspective, that would not be a stumbling block for us. At least it wouldn't be for me. I don't know. I can't speak for every Christian. I just, I know that for me, if a group of Muslims went out in the middle of the field and they began to pray, I'd think, well, as Mark, I think Mark said it last week, actually, I'd be wondering why we're not all out there with them. Mm, why right. we're not out doing our prayer thing, too. I mean, it's just not a stumbling block, and it shouldn't mm-hmm. be a stumbling block for this school system either. And the reason they haven't done anything with the coach is because there is no real precedent. This whole business of the separation of church and state, as misconstrued as we would all agree it is in the minds of most Americans, and certainly of our current system of jurisprudence, this whole thing is 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 moving toward a more finite legal position and here's what i mean if you take this fellow now the game is over right Correct. it's not he's not on the microphone during the game he's not a part of the marching band he's not telling this to his kids well he's the, not even the head coach so no he's, but, the, he's but, not but the even game ordering is over. anybody out there so now he just walks out and he prays okay so where is the line you read in the article that you know the kids have to be you know completely showered changed on the bus at home tucked into bed had a glass of milk and then he can go out there well those lines aren't really drawn and what concerns me about this stuff right here is the reason the school's not doing anything is because they don't really have a legal position it's very gray but well-intentioned people at the aclu and other such wonderful organizations are even now trying to define what that looks like for the next time and what's going to come out of this is never on school grounds never ever ever that's where the law is being pushed right now and and because you would say meet me at the poll you know those uh, exactly examples well and i don't think he's he's not going along the 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 bench recruiting people to come out there and uh pray with him from my understanding he just walks out there and those that want to pray, and that this is a silent prayer. He's not leading a prayer out there. I mean, he's praying silently, but the others come and gather with him, right? Mm -hmm. Well, from what I understand about how far you can go in these things, that's perfectly within the boundaries of of current legal position on this thing. But, um, yeah, it's it's the um, intolerance, you know, of the of the so-called tolerant people that that uh, is do. so astounding. But Robert, we you know we do these things all the way. It's funny the stuff we pick to get picky about. <laughs> a very good example of that is I go home to my high school and the first thing they do, the band comes out in the field and we play what, the national anthem. There are people in the stands who are not from the United States of A, but we're going to play the national anthem and people are going to sing. The people that are not from the United States. They don't have to sing. Right. But it's not an issue. And this is during the game time. This is when the lights are on and the band right. is on the field and the right. announcers in the booth. But no one seems to, that doesn't seem to be a real big deal to anybody. We just say, well, I'm not from this. I, I know when I go to a baseball game in Canada, and I do know the words to, oh, Canada, I just want to say that. <laughs> but I actually don't sing along because mm-hmm. I'm not a Canadian. But it doesn't offend me. 
that Canadians have a national Dude. anthem and they think they want to sing it, eh? Yeah, eh? <laughs> exactly. You know, but this also, this is brings up, there's another uh, story out here. This came from um, professional football, and it was about the Washington Redskins and what was going on in the locker room. Uh, this is from Sports Illustrated. And running back Clinton Porter said Monday on the ESPN 980 that former head coach Jim Zorn had lost respect from his players because of his religious beliefs. Portis, who played under Zorn from 2008-2009, said the divide between Christians and non-Christians on the team was palpable. The subject came up because after Redskins lost, they were asking him, he happened to be on this show, asking him if the current coach had lost the locker room or not. And then he related, no, but here's one that did. He said, this Coach is Zorn. An opinion piece. Yes, this, yes. Coach Zorn lost uh, the locker room because he split the locker room between Christians and ball players. Portis said. So if you didn't believe in what he believed in, and you weren't Antoine Randall L., who was a, who was famous for, actually for his faith, it says that if you were the guys who sat and prayed with him and did everything the way the, uh, they thought your life should be, you got uh, you kind of got well. You're not doing right speeches directed toward you. Former Redskins tight end Chris Cooley backed Portis' claims about Zorn. Coach Zorn might have lost the locker room week 13 of season one, Cooley said. He didn't do it with intent, though. Jim Zorn did it. Didn't come in with intent to say, I want Christians, but he sold his pitch, his sales pitch. Believe in and have faith in my program. So uh, we'll come back and talk a little bit about where we are with, um, again, faith in conflict with our society. And when we come back in just a moment here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. Welcome back here on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And the show between the show <laughs> has been going on here now. Uh, again, with uh, uh, Bishop Doc Loomis and uh, Reverend Robert Carnegie. And we we're talking about um, we were talking about Jim Zorn, who was a former coach of the Redskins, and, and uh, the, the Clinton Portis who made the accusation that his faith divided the locker room. Uh, and and we, we look at this, we're looking at this Bremerton high school coach here, and where his faith seems to be uniting a number of people. Uh, but faith should challenge us, right? I mean, our faith should make us uh, take sides sometimes, right? Well, I love, that's the way Mark talks about it when he's here. And uh, and we miss you, Mark. But, um, you know, hmm. the fact that, well, yeah, <laughs> the fact that, uh, that um, we, we should be different. Christians are called to be, to kind of stand out like a sore thumb in a crowd we're we and it's not something we intentionally cultivate but it's just the way we live our lives and that the the um the the broad way is moving forward and we're kind of over on this little narrow country road mm -hmm. you know heading down and and uh so it's gonna it's gonna be different it's gonna it's gonna contrast at times and we need to push against the the broad way that everybody's you know Mm -hmm. sailing down thinking they're going somewhere and uh so that comes with the turf i think so but the, the complaint though really is about was it uh, divisive i mean was he using it uh, as a dividing line between players and and and, and yeah those on the other side probably yeah. saw it that way yeah. they interpreted his intentions that way but, uh, but but honestly when you're playing pro football or any any pro sport like that or even college now is that if you're not if you're not thinking about wins and losses then then you're not you're not there very long well i'm not a big clinton porters fan frankly i mean he was a good runner a couple of years ago he ran mm -hmm. 14 1500 yards probably i'm just doing this for robert because he doesn't know any stats of football i'm trying to wow you right now i'm wow <laughs> but then his second the next season uh in what was it 09 10 he was pretty lamed up with injuries as i recall so he didn't accomplish much during that year but here's the thing this is a classic example of somebody who doesn't who just has to say something about why they he just i don't know why people feel the need to say something when really nothing needs to be said to fill the space it's, but it's but it's a guy look zorn is just a guy he's a religious guy and the system he was selling was faith and the idea was if we have faith in each other and if we have faith in something greater than ourselves, then we can be a winning football team. Now, you know what? That's not an absolutely horrible 
posture, I don't think. I mean, I'm a Notre Dame fan. They've been preaching faith at Notre Dame, you know, <laughs> since Hector was a pup. Yes. <laughs> so I totally get this Orn thing. But Portis, this is this is like when they interview guys at halftime and you know, or, or at the end of the game, and they say, you know, well, how do you do? It? Well, I don't know. We just, you know, we had a lot of faith, and we, uh, you know, kept moving the chains, and the ball <laughs> kept going further down, and then we scored, and then, uh, you know, it, it was just it was all going our way today. Well, that's just Portis. I mean, he's just. It's a pile of baloney about a guy who is otherwise a really nice guy who had two pretty bad seasons with the Redskins, who are now two and four. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Not nobody's any happier today yeah, yeah. than they were then. Not the only ones yeah. that bad That's a seasons. shout out to my pastor, Dave, who's one yeah. of the big Redskins fans. I have no idea why. Yeah. <laughs> well, look, that used to be our team. used to be the team, team in North Carolina. Because yeah, yeah. that was the Whatever. closest one we had. Yeah. 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 I grew up a Redskins fan. <laughs> Me yeah. too. Yeah, 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 for sure. But, you know, this was a uh, – um, I think this is an example here, though, of – of where even as us as pastors uh, do we do we tend to favor then people who are more like us uh, do we tend to hang around or, or do we go into the shadows and, the, and find those who are not do we in, even in our congregations and do we tend to associate with those who are more like our interests even in and outside of the church uh, or or not and so so I think that's there's there's a, at least an example there. Yeah, you got to be real careful because uh, if you're not making those visitations to the good good Christian folks in your church, you better be you better get on your game instead of just going out and reaching out for that lost shepherd that's wandering out in the wilderness. Because there is that tendency. I guess it depends on your your calling and your makeup. But uh, you know, I'm fairly evangelistic, so I tend to. Look, I'm looking for the for the lost sheep, and it's easy for me to forget about sometimes that I got to go take care of the good ones that are just in the doing what. Well, they're I supposed think to be you doing. can also have some to go the other way. Well, that's right. They only they only stick with the ones who are. That's exactly right. So you, you faithful have, there every Sunday. You, know? you, you have to every once in a while. We need to have that check to mm-hmm. make sure we're uh, we're um, spreading the spreading the the tension, if mm-hmm. you will. Uh, well, let well. Me, uh, let me bring up another story here because this is um, uh, only tangentially related, really, but I'm just going to try to make the segue. Uh, but it, it was a story about a uh, Court of Appeals case in North Carolina uh, about a murderer who confessed uh, to a pastor uh, about about what he had done. And in the appeals uh, court, and I don't have all the, all the details, I have much more of the details about the actual crime, uh, but in this, uh, Victor K., uh, J. Crisco, uh, says that uh, he apparently had made this confession, and so part of the appeal is that is that that confession should not be part about uh, should be part of the evidence against him. However, the prosecutor in the court held that well, he told other people too, so it all became kind of fair game at that point. Uh, but let's talk about confession in the church and what our what our people tell us. Uh, it's an in inviolate. Uh, um, uh, situation right and for anglicans and catholics certainly right, yes it's yeah it's absolutely inviolable we don't we it's not something that we're permitted to share unfortunately the law comes down on our side as it does for mm-hmm. ordained persons in almost every mainline denomination no court can compel us to share uh that the uh, to testify uh mm-hmm. the contents of a confession made in confession you know right. it's, uh, that that can't happen for us, uh, for for pastors, uh, particularly those who come from a Catholic strain. It's actually a violation of our uh, our vows. Mm-hmm. As we become priests, we take vows, and a violation of the vow to share uh, what's spoken in the confessional that actually leads uh, in the mainline Catholic faiths to immediate excommunication, which in Roman. Mm-hmm. Context can only be revoked by the Pope himself. So it's a real big deal. Uh, in North Carolina, according to the article in the News Observer about this Associated Press article, the estate law forbids forcing ordained ministers of an established church from testifying in court about information told them by a person involved. Uh, and, uh, you know, so there's a lot of qualifiers there, ordained ministers of an established church. We don't know exactly how that would go and how that would play in this particular case or in other cases for that matter. Uh, but uh, this, is, this is something, Robert, have you ever faced with? I know uh, in the Methodist uh, church, if uh, someone confesses to you about child abuse 
or uh, there are some exceptions to that that you can actually you are you are required to go to the to report them to authorities. Where are you, where would you say the the um, Catholic Church or others you know Anglican Church would stand on that question about child abuse and um, those well, kind of issues? That's a federal reporting statute. That's period. That, that has to be done. It is a it's a massive exception. Now, does everybody do it? No. This is in part what the issue in the Catholic Church was for a time, right? The idea right, that, exactly. they that didn't. priests are coming to bishops and confessing or getting caught in confessing and then it not being revealed to the public because of the, the vow of the confessional. Right. And uh, now, both in the Roman Church and in, you know, I don't know, in, in our group, uh, we've pretty much adapted to what the United States federal requirements are, which is we report everything and actually it's it's even more than that uh you know th- think about this for a minute we are held to an accountability as christians for the body and the things that happen so take your local mm-hmm. you know parish down there at broad creek we uh are uh, if somebody comes in and confesses that they have done something in the parish then the question is are we then required to make the amends in the parish. In other words, can we let people know that it's happened because it's affecting the body of which the person's a part? If we had a Christian apologist in the room, he could probably answer this brilliantly. <laughs> now, what is that how you how would how would you understand that? Somebody comes in and they have actually sinned against a brother, but yeah. they've confessed it to you. How do you handle that? Yeah. Well, you know, it's the Matthew 18 process that we follow you know within our church when it comes to church discipline now church discipline obviously are, is different than someone committing a a, a statutory mm-hmm. crime you know that right. the government has or may may not be though may not be it may be maybe but before you but, get to matthew 18 you have to decide whether you're going to share that information Correct. Right. Right. But there is a process in Matthew 18 where that does get shared to the church if it goes that far. Now, right. now so I um, from the confessional, that's the question we're dealing with here. Is I mean, I understand if somebody gets up in front of the church and does something or no, it's reported this is even to you, from the, but is it from it, the confessional? Yeah, it, w- it would. It would. If the person is unrepentant in the process, that's where the 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 uh, process. At, escalates a bit as it goes through the pro you know it goes from one-on-one it goes to two witnesses it goes mm-hmm. to the elders it goes to the congregation mm-hmm. and we tend to be congregational in that kind of thing so mm-hmm. yeah well it, it's something that uh i think uh pastors need to continue these kinds of discussions about this how, uh, how you would it's a it. missing element in many of our churches well, uh, thank you for joining us today on Faith Matters on the talk station, FM 107 and AM 1240. And thank our panelists again, Reverend Robert Carnegie and, and uh, Bishop Doc Loomis. And we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for Faith Matters. Email your comments, questions, and suggestions to faithmatters at the talkstation.com. of the talk station.